Good morning. I'm Kimberly Reed, and I'm so honored to be here with this outstanding research conference to discuss the topic of the freedom-based development model in the Indo-Pacific region. I have been thrilled to be a part of the Atlantic Council Freedom and Prosperity Center as a distinguished fellow, and I'd like to thank the staff and uh, Dan Negrea and Michael Fish and, of course, uh, Fred Kempe for uh, their wonderful commitment to things that I hold very dear to me and I've worked on for my entire career. We know that the freedom-based development model, we need to be focused, as we've heard today, on freedom and prosperity beyond just development. And the keys to freedom and prosperity are free markets, rule of law, free press, and democracy. I'll say that Dan and his colleague Matthew Kronig I've just published a new book called We Win and They Lose, and I'd like to read a small excerpt from that. As Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, the American people have an inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or translated in today's language, they have a right to security, freedom, and prosperity. We find the same concepts in the preamble to the Constitution, which says the purpose of US government is to, quote, provide for the common defense, or security, promote for the general welfare, or prosperity, and secure the blessings of liberty, or as we know today, freedom. These values articulated in America's founding documents mirror three primary goals of US foreign policy is spelled out in our countless national security strategies over the years. The security of freedom, security of, and prosperity of the American people. I was most recently concluded a tenure as uh, chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, where I had the honor to see prosperity working around the world, and also seeing where prosperity could work around the world. I witnessed some amazing conversations, I witnessed some amazing business transactions, and I witnessed amazing hope in our country for the world. I was so pleased, and I wear the color purple today, not because I'm an advocate of Alzheimer's and have been on their board for many years, but because I last wore this dress on October 27, 2020, when I was in Burma meeting with State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi, who was my, uh, Burma's de facto leader. We know uh, now that uh, she's under house arrest. But when I had a conversation with her in 2020, it was focused on what we're going to talk about today, freedom and uh, prosperity. I'm also wearing a pin, and it's a bird. And I presented this pin to the Sudanese Minister of Finance in early January 2021, Her Excellency Dr. Hiba Ahmed Ali. It's a replica of the United States First First Lady Martha Washington's Pearl Dove pin. And when I presented this to her in early 2021, I said that it was a declaration of Mrs. Washington's hope for the future, for peace and for prosperity, for the new United States of America. And I wish the same for Sudan. Unfortunately, we've had a coup in Sudan, and we've seen travesty there as well. But this conference will highlight what are the keys to freedom and prosperity. And I'm so pleased to have three experts with us. We're going to be hearing from Ambassador Kelly Curry, who is the former United States Representative, UN Economic and Social Council, and former Alternative Representative to the UN General Assembly. We're going to be hearing from Johanna Cow, Senior Director for Asia Pacific at the International Republican Institute and from Dr. Kotaro Shiojiri, who is the Japan Visiting Fellow at the Wilson Center. When I ask you your first question, I'd love for you to touch also on your own backgrounds, but very, very impressive. And as we go into our discussion today on the freedom-based development model in the, in the Pacific, I'd just like to point out, if you've not looked at, at home or in our audience, the 2023 Prosperity and Freedom Index. And as we look at the Indo-Pacific region, we know that the region is one of the most dynamic and fastest growing regions on Earth. It's an essential driver for security and prosperity. It's home to more than half the world's population and accounts for 60% of, of global GDP, as well as two thirds of global economic growth. 
when we're looking at the United States, trade between the US and the Indo-Pacific region reached over $2 trillion in 2022. And the United States benefits from more than $956 billion in foreign direct investment in the Indo-Pacific. And that's important because we believe that prosperity is what everyone wants in our world. So um, in addition to meeting with Aung San Suu Kyi and um, spending time in the region, I was really honored in 2019 when I was the head of Export Import Bank to attend with uh, Ambassador and National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, the 2019 East Asia Summit. And I was just in awe as I sat in a room with the leaders of the countries of the Indo-Pacific region and learned a lot about what was happening at that time. And what we've seen from then until today is looking at the index. And again, the index ranks uh, countries from the scale of ranking of number one country to 164. Japan, in 2023, when it comes to freedom, ranked 23rd, and prosperity, 22 out of all the countries listed. Taiwan. 27 for freedom, 26 for prosperity. South Korea, freedom, 34, prosperity, 13. Indonesia, freedom, 80, prosperity, 98. And again, out of 164 countries globally. <clears throat> the Philippines, freedom, 102, prosperity, 80. The People's Republic of China, freedom, 144, prosperity, 119. And finally, Burma, freedom 158 and prosperity 151. So how do we get at this? And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Shiojiri. Can you tell us about Japan's initiative regarding free and open Indo-Pacific efforts and its influence in the region? Thank you very much. Uh, it's an uh, honor and pl privilege to be here. And thank you very much for having me uh, here at Atlantic Council. Uh, let me talk uh, first about the free and open Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, vision, uh, which is co so-called FOIP uh, that Japan is presenting, and uh, some of the challenges actually it is facing. Uh, and my background is uh, was an official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan uh, for about 10 years, and I had an early retirement. Uh, so I'm free uh, from the government, <laughs> and I'm, uh, this is my individual view, and I will be critical to Japan as well, so please uh, bear that in mind as well. Uh, but uh, uh, moving back to the FOIP uh, idea, uh, what is it about? Uh, and I will be very succinct and, and will uh, refer to the March 2023 uh, speech by Prime Minister Kishida in New Delhi in India uh, that he did. And also we refer to the 2023 revised uh, development cooperation cha charter that uh, Prime Minister Kishida also revised. Uh, I'll be very uh, clear about the core concept of the FOIP, uh, which is, and I quote, uh, to lead the international community in the direction of cooperation rather than division and confrontation, which sort of resonates with the domestic politics as well, but we are focusing on international community and international politics. And some of the uh, goals include enhancing the connectivity of the Indo-Pacific region, fostering the region into a place that value freedom, the rule of law, free from force and coercion, which resonates to what you mentioned earlier, and also make the region prosperous. So these are the core concepts. And uh, quickly moving forward, uh, let me focus on the challenges that uh, some of the FOIP ideas are having, uh, which I think is important in terms of how to build partnership in the region, how to uh, move forward with this idea, uh, which is very important, I think, in order to implement the idea. So my question is, how do you gain support from the countries in the region uh, when you have these uh, concepts? And I think there are three folds uh, to that answer. And number one is the power of concept vision itself. Number two is the attitude or approach. And number three is the quantity or the tangible uh, benefit that they will get uh, from this concept or vision. So number one concept and vision, the power of it, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, very clear uh, from the outset. But I think the defending freedom, the rule of law, is very important when you're facing some concerns of attempts to change the status quo. Uh, by force or a coercion is something that uh, the region, uh, the countries are being worried about. So how to help uh, them address that, uh, including Japan, uh, is, is one of the th core concepts. And also respect, respect for diversity, 
inclusiveness and openness is also something that it needs to be addressed, uh, which is the FOIP uh, is one of the efforts to address that as well. Number two is the attitude and approach, which I think uh, is very important and maybe slightly different from the US approach. Japan approach is to sort of, uh, through dialogue and collaboration and as equal partners, uh, two ways that relationship needs to be uh, driven and also uh, the focus on people needs to be done, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, the importance to focus on people. And quickly move forward to number three is the quantity or the tangible methods, uh, which I believe is important. And to that, uh, Japan is proposing to mobilize a total of more than 75 billion US dollars in the public and private uh, funds by the year 2030, uh, which is probably not enough. And that's why I think Japan needs to partner with other countries, of course, and that the, the power of the co coalition or partnership uh, matters. So let me stop here uh, by laying out some of the core concepts of FOIP and also challenges, uh, but saying that it's easy to say, uh, difficult to do, and it's a very daunting task. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <coughs> Johanna, can we discuss the China chapter <laughs> in two general area, the areas? Talk about the broader uh, prosperity opportunity and whether it's happened or not and the clear commitment by the Chinese Communist Party to inequality. Sure, um, I'm happy to. So um, just, just by way of, of a, a slightly extended introduction, I, I, the organization I work for, International Republican Institute, that we, we work on democratic assistance. Uh, I'm, I oversee our Asia Pacific region. Um, and so you know, covering the, the scope of, of the, the region we're gonna be talking about today, uh, 23 country programs, and I have had the, the honor of being able to sort of live and work in that region for most of my life, um, moving to DC a few years ago. Um, this China chapter, working on this China chapter, it was a really unique opportunity to take a step back um, and look at the data um, with sort of overlaying it with my own direct experience, sort of working with partners both inside China and outside. So I appreciate from the Atlantic Council the opportunity to do that. Um, and I want to get at your question by first sort of getting into a little bit of the context on what the, the indices were really showing in terms of, of, of kind of freedom first before we get into the prosperity. Because, you know, I, I think one of the things that come ac comes across in the data is it's this dance, right, that the Communist Party of China has been trying to do to promote economic growth while also maintaining control of Chinese society. And so, you know, what you see in those early years uh, in, in the index um, is, it is, is gradual improvement. It's gradual improvement of freedom after about 1995. Um, you know, this was a period of experimentation where, um, you know, things were really starting to open up. Um, people's, you know, state control was decreasing and people's lives were improving. You know, I went to China for the first time in 1981 as, as a child with my family. And I just, what I remember from that was the sameness of everything. Um, and yet, by sort of 1995 onwards, this, to this period that we're tracking, this is a time when China went from a place where everything had been provided by the state to a place where everything was being provided in markets, right? And that change was really significant. And so around that same time, the, the experimentation, I think, also extended to society and governance. Um, and this is where there's this impact on, on prosperity. You know, so you have projects like increasing women's political participation and enabling some public advocacy on some things. I mean, there were limits, right? This was post Tiananmen Square. Um, there were restrictions, there were controls, um, and it was particularly difficult for, for certain groups of people, which, which we can get into later. But then what you started to see around 2008, 2009 in the data is where things started to shift, right? You start to see the party trying to, these efforts to re-exert control, um, but maintain economic growth, maintain the prosperity. Um, and I think that context is really important to, to think about as we're, as we're looking, as I was looking at that, the indices. And so to kind of get to your question, the kind of three conclusions from the, the data that I wanted to highlight um, on prosperity in particular, you know, it's, it's underwhelming, uneven, and unequal, <laughs> right? Um, so, so first, I think I would say overall, the data is underwhelming, right? You have... China, we know, had this period of just phenomenal economic growth. 
Um, you know, but the Chinese people saw really only modest gains, if any, right, across a range of these freedom and prosperity indices. Um, you know, when you look at this in comparison to East Asia Pacific, um, other countries had improved freedoms, uh, even with slower economic growth, right? And so it just overall, they seem to do more with less. Um, and I, I found that really striking looking at the data um, in that comparative sense, this sense of just a really significant missed opportunity um, by the CCP to create a more modern and dynamic society, right? They had the means to do it and it didn't happen, you know, a society that could actually reflect the Chinese dream that Xi Jinping keeps talking about. Um, so, so that's one, one observation of, of where the pros it didn't translate into, into prosperity for, for Chinese people. The second sort of observation is the unevenness of that prosperity, right? It, it's unsurprising that the sort of most remarkable sort of trend, the most remarkable improvement came in economic prosperity, right? And that is, it should absolutely be recognized as this achievement by the party, by the government, and by the Chinese people. Um, but it's a very complex reality in China, right? At a very basic level, China's economic growth has been uneven because certain areas got priority and preferential treatment over others. And, and this has generally been sort of seen as sort of urban coastal areas that got preference compared to sort of the rural sort of inland away from the coast areas, right? And so while GDP per, per capita um, might average out to look like growth, um, there's a lot of poverty in China sort of outside of urban centers. And I think very importantly, and this really comes through in the data, that unevenness of how prosperity is distributed is not, it's not just uneven economically. It basically, if you fall outside of sort of some accepted norms of what the Parsi says, such as if you belong to a religious or ethnic minority, your quality of life is significantly worse than the average person, right? And so, you know, what I take from that is that while, while a lack of progress on certain kinds of freedoms, you know, it could be explainable at least by the party's instinct to retain control, I think the, the inability to deliver more equitable prosperity to citizens by the CCP, that just seems like a missed opportunity. And then to, your, to, to the last one, you know, my final conclusion about this, what seems to be this CCP commitment to just an unequal form of governance. Right. Since the beginning of the Communist Party of China, it has, it has sort of touted this collectivist approach that it has, right? The well-being of the collective was more important than the well-being of the individual, right? But what, what the data really shows, I think, um, is that it's actually a more selective approach. There are certain groups that are favored at the expense of others, right? Now, this inequality, that's not new within the CCP system, right? There's always been winners and losers. You have party elites, you have their affiliated businesses. They rake in the benefits of this extraordinary growth. Well, you know, ordinary citizens see sort of much more modest gains. Um, but again, what I think the data shows is what I see is a shift towards a much more absolute rather than a relative sense of inequality, right? There are clear losers in this system. Um, and not only have they not made gains, they've actually seen really significant losses in their freedoms. And so again, it's groups like ethnic and religious minorities, women, the LGBTQ plus community, right? These are groups that challenge the party's claims to legitimacy and they have not seen the benefits at all of the prosperity that could have that could have come. Thank you very much. Before we turn to uh, Ambassador Curry, I would just want to remind uh, those in the audience and at home to send us your questions at askac.org, and we will get to those. Kelly, you're focusing on Burma in new research. Can you shed some light on? Uh, countries trying new models and what works versus the development models that have fallen short. Um, well, thank you, and it's um, it's really wonderful to be able to participate on this panel and learn from my colleagues. And also, I was really ruminating on some of the things that our keynote speaker this morning, Damon Asimoglu, said about how what is causing the regression in democracy and how that relates to, to the paper that I'm working on um, for the council. And the project this paper is nested within that compares authoritarian development models, mostly the Chinese development model, 
with what I call the development industrial complex approach that the West has mm -hmm. basically defaulted to. And I say that because I do feel like we have defaulted to a somewhat lazy um, institutional ecosystem of organizations, whether it's the Bretton Woods Institutes or our own bilateral aid agencies or um, the multilateral aid agencies, um, all of these things, they are like, you know, we make jokes about the blob in terms of foreign policy, but there's also a development blob. And that is basically what the West uses to promote economic development in the world. And neither, it's not serving our interests very well right now, and it's not serving the interests of the developing world very well either. And I'll give you a good example before I get to get to Burma. Um, this Just this week, the World Bank came out with a new survey that um, talked about what the priorities for were for its clients, what it's what the clients' priorities are, the borrowers, the countries that the bank is supposed to be helping guide toward prosperity and support in that process. And out of 17 topics that the banks, a list of 17 topics, climate was number 11 for for the the they wanted education, they want health care, they want jobs development, they want good governance and public administration. The clients, the, the developing countries. It's the, the shareholders, the, the donor countries that are pushing this climate agenda. Now, are there, of course, countries like the low-lying island states where climate is an existential threat and they need real support on there so that they can give health care, education, and jobs to their populations? Of course. But in the aggregate, most of the World Bank's climate uh, clients are not, in, are not prioritizing climate change. It's the donor-driven behavior. And so this is a pathology that we see over and over again in the way that we approach these countries. And Burma is a great example. And it's also a great way. Burma, I chose Burma as the first case study for what will be, a, we hope, a series of papers looking looking at how these different development <laughs> models that China is putting out in the world and that the Western industrialized democracies are putting out in the world, how they actually play out on the ground where they are, where they are not meeting the needs of these countries. Because this, this paper on Burma basically shows that both of these models failed in Burma hmm. and continue to fail abjectly. Um, between, and it looks at this 15 year period, right, between 2009 and, and now. Um, where you saw Burma go from being a pariah state that was ruled by a military regime that was one of the worst, most regressive in the world. They were the, one of the lowest recipients per capita of overseas development assistance in the world. And they were had socioeconomic indicators that were at sub-Saharan African levels. They were down in the least developed band, bottom 10%, just as they are today. But they've gone, for, they've gone in a circle, right? They went from that. Between, in that 15-year period, they had a managed transition to a more democratic or at least more open and accountable form of governance over a 10-year period where the military stepped back from direct rule, allowed a quasi-civilian um, institution to come in. As soon as the West decided that it was good enough for the Burmese people, which was not very good, I will be very clear here, the military still had ultimate control, the economy was still um, dominated by rent-seeking cronies who owed their, um, their wealth and their, their ability to do business to their ties to the military, the military still itself had a huge chunk of the economy. Like All of these things were still in place. Burma was still spending 1% of its GDP on health and education. But that's not good, just for, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, you know, but the, the West decided, yeah, good enough for us. Um, soft bigotry of low expectations. We're going to flood the zone. We're going to change Burma from being a conflict fragile, you know, conflict affected fragile state into a transition. And we're going to start throwing our transition toolkit at them. And just we're all in. Literally 10 percent of the po of the parliament at that point was represented by a popularly elected party. The rest were still the military's holdover. But the, the world just was like, yeah, we're good. We're good with that. The Burmese people, of course, were not. They continued to repudiate this, and they continued to ask for different things, both politically, economically, and socially from the international community, but we didn't listen. We imposed our toolkits and our models and our technical assistance on them, and the results were not good. 
In the meantime, China had never left Burma. They didn't care what kind of government was there. They cared about their interests, which were getting access, as Joe talks about the coastal areas in China, these inland areas in southwest China, landlocked, not benefiting from this big economic boom. The Chinese leadership was like, ooh, we can go through Burma and get to the Indian Ocean. This will be awesome for us. Let's build a giant port in Burma. Boom. They start building a giant port and connecting it through an oil and gas pipeline and transportation corridor. And this is their new string of pearls strategy. They're doing it in Gwadar and in Pakistan, and they're doing it in Jokpu in Burma. Did they care that they were building that pipeline through areas where there was a civil war going on? Oh, heck no, they did not. They're paying off people on both sides. They're selling weapons to people on both sides. They do not care. Can we go in and do that? N no, no, we cannot. But that's what they're doing. So when things open up, the, Biden, uh, the Obama administration um, decided, again, part of the calculus here of why we rushed in despite and, and flooded this gold rush. Joe was there. She remembers what it was like. It was insane. We just, like, the number of World Bank, IMF, you know, EU development, USAID, DFID, um, AUSAID, N Norway, all of them, just like, it, it was insane. It was, I, 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 I don't overstate it to say that it was insane. Um, all these people coming in with their technical assistance and their toolkits and all of this stuff and, and overwhelming civil society, overwhelming the Burmese. Meanwhile, China's just chugging along, doing what they do, identifying an interest and doing whatever they need to do to accomplish it. And we are like all over the place. They did have a bump in Burma where the Burmese government canceled a big dam project or suspended a big dam project. <laughs> China got mad at first. They blamed the United States for it when it was really, they misunderstood that the Burmese people really wanted this um, project canceled. But instead of, but after their initial kind of pouting about it, they went to work. They started taking NLD members on study tours of China. They started taking ethnic leaders on study tours of China. They stopped just paying attention to the government and started paying attention to all these civil society people. Meanwhile, we, the West, who had spent decades supporting civil society, providing support to them outside of the country, inside of the country, supporting the NLD and their fight for democracy. All our attention is being paid to the government people in Naypyidaw, and we're kind of halfway paying a little bit of attention to the civil society and the ethnics, and, and China's focused on them like a laser beam. It, we've like basically done everything possible wrong in Burma that we could. China has done basically what for their own interests makes sense, but it's also been a disaster for the Burmese people. Today, Burma is back in, under military rule directly. There is a massive civil war going on. You cannot not blame China for part of it because of their willingness to back the military at all costs and their willingness to ignore human rights and democracy concerns. But you also cannot not blame us because we did the same thing. We tried to, to sort of do a China light approach where we'd have some concerns about human rights and democracy and freedom. But really, at the end of the day, if we could get our companies in there on the ground, if we could, you know, get get our military talking to their military and, and address our, our geopolitical concerns, we were much more focused on doing those things than we were on what do the Burmese people want? What do they need? And so we were continually surprised by what the Burmese people wanted and what did they need because we never really bothered to ask them, at least our government didn't. So there's a lot that you can learn from this context, I think. And I think it, it's a very good illustration of how we misunderstand and, and misunderestimate, to use a good George W. Bush <laughs> word, what it is our partners want, mostly because we don't ever ask or listen to them when, we, when they try to tell us. It also shows that we don't always articulate ourselves or even show a lot of fidelity and belief in this idea that freedom is essential to prosperity. We go around the world saying this and acting in a completely different way. The, and, and we don't, we fail to acknowledge that our principles are our superpowers. And instead, when we go around and, and because we put out these principles, but then we turn around and act in completely unprincipled ways on the ground, it, it's, it's really, undermines us and how we can do things. And a big piece of this is that 
you know, we, because we use this development industrial complex that spends a lot of time talking to itself, building itself up, and, and you know, coming up with toolkits and jobs for, you know, graduates of elite universities in Western developed countries, instead of trying to figure out what it is that people on the ground want, we, we miss a lot of opportunities. And we've created this system that is not only not effective in, in meeting the needs of these developing countries, and it's really annoys the crap out of most Americans, taxpayers too, when they see all of this stuff going on, and most, most developed democracy country taxpayers too. And so nobody's happy with our system, and it's not accomplishing anything for the people it's supposed to accomplish for. So I think we need to really start to rethink about how we're doing this, and I think putting freedom back at the center of it is the very first step that we need to take. And I'll stop there. Th thank, thank you very much. Um, so, so we've talked about Japan and Burma and China. Uh, Dr. Shio Jiri, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. And so can you touch on U.S. Uh, Republic of Korea-Japan relations? And obviously Korea is doing great on the index. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, the recent development of the trilateral relationship is remarkable. Uh, we had the Camp David summit, and afterwards we had uh, several rounds of uh, ministerial level, working level, and development in the economic security uh, uh, area as well. And I think uh, Prime Minister Kishida is coming to D.C. in April. But before that, in March, uh, I think it's March 20th, he's going to Seoul. And then after that, he will come to D.C. So there is a sequence there. So I believe that there are trilateral relations that are developing. And uh, related to the idea of FOIP, I think uh, South Korea also developed its uh, own Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. And U.S. also has uh, its own Indo-Pacific strategy. And they. Uh, collaborate each other, and uh, which uh, resonates with uh, what uh, Ambassador uh, told us about uh, what is it that our partners want is also something that is uh, very important and what U.S., Japan, and South Korea can collaborate on. Uh, so I believe there are a lot of things happening uh, uh, in the political level and also the implementation level, which obviously needs more time to develop, but I think one of the fields that they are working on and that I, I'm uh, focused on is economic security uh, area, the uh, sustainability and economic um, security and how to deter economic coercion uh, in the region is one of the topics that I'm very interested in, in in terms of this trilateral relationship. Thank you very much. Johanna, so you mentioned that your portfolio includes 23 countries. Mm -hmm. So um, what other models uh, can you offer uh, the audience that work or absolutely failing? Well, I mean, I actually was wanting to pick up on what Kelly was talking about because, you know, I think the the ways in which we you know we as the US really need to rethink how we are approaching the countries with which with whom we want to partner um, the countries who we see as allies or at least as strategic partners um, really needs a rethink and, and I would throw out Indonesia um, as a case that that deserves that sort of warrants attention because you know this is a place where I think the US has 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 really not done a very good job of of understanding what uh, making an effort to understand what it is that that Indonesians are looking for from the relationship and understanding sort of where Indonesia is in itself. I mean, this is a country that you know all the superlatives, right? It just had the largest single day election <laughs> in the world. Um, it's the largest Muslim majority country. It's the third largest democracy, right? It is also geostrategically incredibly important, just because of the size of its economy, but also because of its location. Um, you know, when Kelly was talking about sort of the way in which China has been making its inroads in, in Burma because of the work it has put in to building relationships. We see very similar patterns in Indonesia where you know, the CCP has been taking people to, you know, on party exchanges to Beijing. Um, they have been buying up the media space and ensuring that, there's, that they have influence through various channels in that way. You know, and, and I think our approach, unfortunately, has been, you know, Indonesia is a democracy. Indonesian people put tremendous amount of investment of themselves into their democracy. Um, and at a certain point, sort of, I don't know, Kelly, it was sort of like in the mid 2010s, I think, the US sort of essentially said, well, Indonesia's done. We're, it's, a, it's a democracy, and we don't, we don't need to engage with it in the same way. And that, that's fine. But I, I think Indonesian people, Indonesian stakeholders, we're still struggling. And, I, and what's happened over the last decade has been 
an erosion of the democratic institutions that Indonesian people worked so hard and fought so hard to 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 sustain, um, and that's where you know I, I do think. It's, it warrants that larger rethink um, that Kelly was talking about. Of how are we approaching um, these kinds of partnerships? And, and if we're leading with, with our values, which we should, um, what does that look like in a context of understanding where, where our partners, what, what they need from us and how, how we can cooperate with them? I know at my time at the Export Import Bank, uh, 2019 to 2021, worked really hard to stand up a new program called China and Transformational Experts. Exports. Congress gave Exim the ability to match the rate terms and conditions mm -hmm. that the Chinese Communist Party was offering to a foreign buyer of uh, made in the USA goods or services. We wanted the world to buy American. Not um, We know we make the best goods in the world, but that's also important uh, for freedom in, in many ways ways. And one of those technologies that we focused on was something that Dan Negre also worked on at the State Department through something called the Deal Team with Undersecretary Keith Kroc. And that was on um, uh, technology such as 5G. And uh, worked really hard with the prior leadership in Indonesia and in other key countries. And uh, what's happening on this, this, this world of uh, technology? I was frustrated to see the Solomon Islands uh, sign up the Chinese Communist Party's 5G system instead of America's uh, last year. But uh, what, what do you see on the technology front? Well, I think, again, it's not that they have better tech. Um, they have cheaper tech, that's for sure, and they subsidize the heck out of it so that it it's stays cheaper and we can't compete on the price. Um, we can only compete on quality and we can only compete on wrapping it around. It's got to, you know, we've got to come in with not just here's the tech, but it's the wraparound services. If you look at a lot of the projects that China has done in the past 10 years on the Belt and Road, one of the things that we keep seeing is that they put, they come in with a lot of pledges and a lot of fanfare and they build something and then it sits there and it they forget to train people on how to operate it it they don't have a maintenance budget for how to keep it up and the, the and it falls apart and so all of these things I mean again China is learning they're not standing still they are figuring out what they're doing wrong and taking steps to correct it and so you've seen this with the Belt and Road how they've like said we're going to have higher quality um, you know, higher quality projects now, but that's a direct reaction to what we were doing, where we lean into quality and we lean into higher standards to to force a change in their behavior, which I think was really important part of what was done by Dan and Keith Kroc and others. I was on a trip with Keith Kroc, to, and, but it's also something we can't just do by ourselves. And this is where our partners in Japan, our partners in South Korea, um, our partners in Taiwan. I went with Keith on a trip to Taiwan where we were talking about um, what ultimately became the CHIPS Act and building the FAB in Arizona and, the, and how hard it was and continues to be. You know, we're still resolving tax issues for the Taiwanese. We make it hard on ourselves in a lot of ways. And part of that is that we don't have a good way to explain, you know, we need to make sure that what we're doing is just as understandable to somebody in Tulsa as it is to somebody in Taipei. That it's just, you know, that somebody in Des Moines and somebody in Dushanbe can clearly understand what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and what they're going to get from it. Like, we don't do that. We don't even try most of the time. We are so technocratic and so talking to ourselves about this stuff all the time. I mean, I, I, I love the fact that there is a platform called DevX that is literally like the in-house news organ of the development community, but that's also kind of a <laughs> horrifying thing. You read it and it's like, does, it, does everybody know about this stuff? I mean, it's really wild what we're doing and how we don't do a great job. Technology is our friend in that way. We can use it to help explain what we're doing better, but it also becomes a lazy default where we think if we put something out there, that means that that's done. Like, we tweet it and that's it. It's like, no, you can't tweet it and forget it. You actually have to really make more of an effort to explain to our own taxpayers in, in our developed um, democracies who are the donors funding this stuff and to the people who are meant to be the beneficiaries, what it is we're doing. But we've also got to become much more ruthless about getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work. We can't just keep this stuff around because it worked 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We've got to look at this and say, is it fit for purpose? Is it doing what we want it to do? And if it's not, 
then we need to dump it and get rid of it. And we don't have the luxury of keeping around legacy projects and institutions that are not fit to purpose in the world that we live in now and the competition that we're facing today. If I could just jump in on the technology piece to pick up on what Kelly was saying, I think the other layer of technology is, of course, the use, the export uh, by China of surveillance technologies mm -hmm. um, the, into countries across the Indo-Pacific. Um, and again, going back to really needing to both work with countries, work with our partners to help build an understanding of what are the risks? What, what, what are they getting when they bring these technologies in? But I think also listening to people, right? Listening to the concerns of civil societies in the countries in which these, these things are being brought in. What are the concerns about privacy? What are their concerns about access to information? And are there ways that we can be constructive and helpful um, in ensuring that the free, the, the free space, the space for free exchange, the, free, the space for free association can continue to exist? But I thought Damon made a really good point this morning, though, about how the United States, we're, we're happy to give all our data to an unaccountable corporate entity, but we're very protective of the government having our data. And then in other contexts, you know, it's the opposite. And I think, you know, the Europeans have a different system. And then China is out there marketing a model that's very attractive to your average country, developing or not. And I think that we've got to be conscious of how our own policy decisions domestically and the way that we think about data protection and all of and privacy impact how we then go out in the world and and sound crazy when we're like yeah you should do what we do with the social media and that people are like yeah no thanks that's <laughs> terrible yeah, I, I could jump in a little bit that uh, the economic coercion is is, is somewhat uh, close to the technology field and economy field and I think there are studies in Australia and, and Germany that has done that uh, the China's co coercion cases there has been more than 100 cases over the last 10 years so how to deter those is one of the uh, core uh, a uh, field that we can work on together as US, Japan, and South Korea, and other countries. And I think that's where uh, we need to work uh, on it uh, with the freedom and prosperity uh, in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Well, not received any questions yet. Again, askac.org. You've just got a few seconds to send it in, but uh, we'll watch the screen here. And uh, to close us out quickly, I'd love just three suggestions from each of you on what all of the countries in the Indo-Pacific region should be doing to move up their freedom and prosperity scores in the index. What, what are your recommendations? I mean, I think I'd pick up on, on the things we've been talking about of partnership. Uh, you know, I, I think the, 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 the learning that can be done when we're, we're actually really making the effort to understand where, where these countries are coming from and what their needs are. And I think particularly with, the, with, the, with our colleague from Japan, um, you know, Japan and Korea and the opportunity that's there for these democracies and Taiwan to be taking more of a leadership role um, in, in, helping, in helping bridge some of these, these, these connections and partnerships, um, I think is going to be very important. And I um, uh, agree, um, uh, more, I can't agree more, but I think the important phrase that, uh, from Kelly is that what is it that our partners want mm -hmm. is uh, that uh, struck out uh, to me as well. And, and in my opening uh, remarks, I said that uh, it is a second approach uh, and uh, attitude that we need to build on, and that's something that we need to do. And uh, I believe that is one of the important things. And I think the study like uh, Atlantic Council is doing about uh, the relationship between freedom and prosperity, I think that matters. And the power of those studies in academic world also uh, matters in politics as well. So I uh, thank for Atlantic Council and thank you for being here. And mine's pretty straightforward, women. If you look at the region and you disaggregate out the growth over the past 20 years, the biggest contributor, and I wrote the chapter on this for the, the book, the, um, the map, if women's ac economic participation had not grown the way it has in the Indo-Pacific region, growth would essentially be flat across the region. I was stunned, and I was the U.S. ambassador at large for global women's issues, and I was stunned to see this in the data because I figured education, healthcare improvements, um, regulatory environment improvements that would have more, it was women's workforce participation, boom. That is it. It's like a huge, huge key. China's going in the opposite direction. They're trying to you know, force women to have babies instead of working. They're making it harder for women to work. And if you want to grow your economy, it's one word, women. Yeah. 
Well, with that, I also <laughs> want to say it's women in small business. The world um, that's loves. What they're, that's where they work, yeah. by yeah. the way. <laughs> so with that, let's thank our panelists. Thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to freedom in the Indo-Pacific. <laughs>